Now I should point out that I only have time to provide a real brief outline today. Uh, but if you would like a PDF copy of my book, uh, free, uh, please contact me at my email address, Hector pv at comcast.net, so up, up here, Hector, uh, Achilles' friend, uh, Paul Victor, at comcast.net. Well, the neoconservatives were the driving force in the 2003 war in Iraq. And the neoconservatives have a close relationship with the Israeli Likudnik right. And they are essentially a hard line element of the Israel lobby here in the United States. The neocons had come into existence in the early 1970s. Uh, the original neoconservatives were converts from liberalism. They were heavily Jewish, although there are a sizable number of Gentiles in the group. And they are concerned about Jewish interests. They believe that a number of aspects of 1970s liberalism had become dangerous to Jewish interests. One of these was liberalism's de-emphasis on the threat of the Soviet Union. The neoconservatives saw the Soviet Union as being anti-Semitic and anti-Israel, and they took a very hard-line anti-Soviet foreign policy position. Now, after failing to move the Democratic Party in their direction, the neocons would switch to supporting uh, the Republicans in 1980 as Ronald Reagan ran for the presidency. And despite being newcomers, the neoconservatives were able to get positions, a large number of positions, in the Reagan administration. And they played a significant role in pushing Reagan's foreign policy in a hard line foreign policy direction. Now, I might say at that time they had support from traditional conservatives as well, but they did play a significant role. Now, with the demise of Soviet communism, the neoconservatives' foremost concern became Israel and the Middle East. In 2001, as Bush administration began, the neoconservatives had already developed their plan to reconfigure the Middle East. And according to them, this would make the Middle East more peaceful, democratic, and less a threat to the United States. However, this plan to reconfigure the Middle East would entail the elimination of regimes that were hostile to Israel beginning with Iraq and including Iran, Syria, and even Saudi Arabia. Now, this plan had strong similarities to a geostrategy that prevailed on the Israeli right in the 1980s and was best articulated by Likudnik Oded Yanon in a 1982 article. In that article, he maintained that Israel's enemies were quite fragile and only held together by harsh dictatorial regimes. This, he claimed, would make it relatively easy to bring them down since there wasn't any natural support in these countries for them. And he held that if these countries were disturbed by war, they would fragment into ethnic and sectarian groups who would war among each other. Uh, of course, this would, by weakening Israel's enemies, this would, of course, enhance the security of Israel 
and Yanon advocated that Israel launch a war. Now, in 1996, neocons Douglas Fife, Richard Pearl, and David Wormser would be part of a small group that presented a variant of this strategy to then incoming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, it's sort of interesting that Americans are advising Israel. Uh, and this plan, entitled A Clean Break, would again have Israel begin this process of reconfiguring the Middle East by war. But very soon after this, however, the neocons would have the U.S. as the war initiator, presumably acting uh, for American interests. However, the neocons acknowledged that their policy would benefit Israel and held that this was simply because American and Israeli interests were identical. But the background for many, if not most, of the neocons shows a close personal identification with the state of Israel. It's reasonable to say, I think, that the neoconservatives viewed American foreign policy in the Middle East through the lens of Israeli interest as perceived by the Israeli Likudniks. Now, with the onset of the Bush, George W. Bush administration in 2001, the neoconservatives have become a powerful network of think tanks, organizations, and media outlets. Vice President Dick Cheney, uh, who had a, a very close connection to the neoconservatives for a number of years prior to 2001, played the major role in bringing them in to the George W. Bush administration. The neoconservatives, however, didn't get the upper hand in shaping American Middle East foreign policy until after the 9-11 terror attacks. This terrorism enabled the neocons of bogus propaganda and militaristic agenda to resonate with the American people and with Congress, that 9-11 made the American people uh, fearful and angry, and the neocons provided a uh, way of retaliating and, of course, the neocons did connect Saddam Hussein with this terrorism, along with emphasizing his alleged extremely dangerous WMD. Uh, President George uh, W. Bush was essentially a convert to the neocon agenda. Now, to achieve their war on Iraq, the neocons had to overcome opposition of one degree or another from other parts of the executive branch, the military, the State Department, the CIA, and from members of the traditional foreign policy establishment who put their emphasis on America maintaining stability in the Middle East uh, in order to facilitate the flow of oil. Of course, the neocon plan would bring about instability. Now, as the trauma of 9-11 wore out, this opposition was able to prevent the neoconservatives from continuing their Middle East war agenda to bring about regime change in Iran and, and elsewhere in the Middle East in the same direct manner as they had achieved war on Iraq. However, the neocons have been able to move American foreign policy and the Middle East uh, to some extent, to a, I could say a significant extent, uh, 
in the direction that they saw it, even though more indirectly than directly like war in Iraq. So now we know there are stringent sanctions and require, various requirements placed on Iran uh, put in lieu of war, but certainly harming Iran. Uh, Syria, Iran's ally, is in a state of collapse and fragmentation. Uh, there's a regional Shiite-Sunni war that spread from Iraq, so all of Israel's enemies are fighting among each other. So essentially, Israel's enemies are fragmented and warring among each other, just as Yanon had predicted and, of course, hoped for. So overall, I think one could say Israel's geostrategic position has improved, at least from the viewpoint of the Israeli right, uh, whereas the United States uh, uh, is, uh, interest, if one would hold the traditional belief in the need for stability in the region, well, that has obviously worsened. Well, thank you very much.